Welcome to the podcast. If you'd like to listen to an ad-free version of this episode and all of our episodes, then search True Crime Today Premium Plus on Apple Podcasts and press subscribe. That's our premium channel where all of our ad-free and advanced episodes live all in one place. True Crime Today Premium Plus. Search it on Apple Podcasts and press subscribe. Even try it for three days free. The last thing they saw was someone they trusted. You're tuned in to Hidden Killers with Tony Bruschi, featuring retired FBI special agent and chief of the counterintelligence behavioral analysis program, Robin Dreek. Trial of Richard Allen, it is underway right now in Delphi, Indiana. And uh, it's a case that uh, obviously has captivated us for quite some time. Is Richard Allen guilty of killing those two girls on that bridge, Abby Williams and Libby German back in February of 2017. It's a case that, uh, from what we're seeing now in the courtroom, relying thus far heavily on eyewitness testimony. And we all know eyewitness testimony. Yeah, it can be good, it can be bad, it can be all over the board. And that's what we've seen thus far. Joining me to discuss Robin Drake, retired FBI special agent, chief of the counterintelligence behavioral analysis program. Um, yeah, let's talk about this. Let's start with eyewitness testimony before we even get into what we've heard at the uh, the trial itself. Um, let's talk about its reliability um, and and how that is gauged from person to person. Yeah, our our eyewitness testimony is always subject to context of the individual receiving the information, time from the time it was observed to the time it was recorded and reiterated on someone else. Influences that come to us between the time of viewing the information or the event, as well as the time of um, recounting it to someone else, mm -hmm. the input that was happening there, because that's what we're seeing in the court is I'm seeing potential for a lot of false memories being planted here yeah. by just by someone making a suggestion it could be this or it could be this to someone that was an eyewitness that really influences what we remember mm -hmm. and it, that's why you know, one of the one of the great tenets of doing investigations is a, a simple one go where the evidence brings you and evidence is generally very tangible tactile types of things and eyewitness testimony generally is not that tangible, tactile kind of evidence you're looking for. And so it can be extremely subjective in a lot of different ways uh, from not just how they're recounting it, the individual that saw it, the age, uh, the time span. All these things make it extremely subjective, which makes it a very challenging case for prosecution to rely on that alone. Let me ask you this, because the... Uh, the jury is hearing a lot of testimony from different eyewitnesses in this case so far. Uh, some of the eyewitness testimony seeming to be pretty accurate, actually, and 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 backed up and proven with surveillance footage. Uh, that would be the testimony thus far uh, of uh, a woman who was out hiking on the bridge, used it uh, quite regularly for that. Uh, noticed Richard Allen's car when she entered the uh, the trail when she came back. Uh, his car was gone. And that's a key a key piece of this whole case thus far uh, from Betsy Blair. That's the name of the woman who has given this testimony. Because if that's true, and her timeline lines up of the time she says she left the parking lot and, and got in her car and Richard Allen's car was gone, um, of him not being there. And that same time point is when the state is saying he was in the woods killing those kids. Uh, it, it actually shows that he would have already gone for his walk and left <laughs> and and had been on with his day uh if in fact he you know went to his car and left just as he kind of said he did uh that's some interesting testimony uh she also claims that she did see him out there uh as well and and actually had more of a an accurate physical description you have two people who were 16 at the time two girls who were out there now in their 20s testifying to this uh and both of them claiming they saw a bridge guy quote unquote very dramatically different descriptions of the guy, like almost like it could be a completely different person. I almost kind of wonder if it was. Um, so yet you have consistent and very inconsistent over here. Um, one with timestamps and receipts to go with it. The other one, just these two girls recollecting what they saw when they were 16. And now can, that was 2017. So, it's, you know, they're in their twenties now. Let's talk about the accuracy of that and how a jury is going to perceive that where one seems to be pretty on par and the other one's like all over the board. Yeah, it's not beyond reasonable doubt, is it? 
I don't, I mean, it, it certainly kind of creates some doubt. I mean, in terms of like the information that's coming in, it's just the reliability of the information is, is what's that question. And I, and I wonder if, if they're going to look at the two girls, the younger girl's testimony and go, that's not reliable. And it's eyewitness. Why is this one reliable over here? Even though there's a lot more that backs up the other one, if it's just kind of be throw the baby out with the bathwater, all eyewitness testimony is bunk because with these two girls over here, it was really very scratchy. So w- with this case, this is, Man, I, I can't even believe I'm kind of saying this because normally I'm always saying where there's smoke, there tends to be fire. Mm-hmm. And definitely Richard Allen was in the area. Yeah, I, I don't I think that's ir- irrefutable. You mm-hmm. know, he was seen, he was observed, he's in the area. So that's smoke. But we're trying to draw that smoke to the fire of the death. Yeah. And normally when you're seeing eyewitness accounts and testimony and, and things like this, whether they're consistent, inconsistent, all these things. Now, what we want to do is we want to back it up with tangible physical evidence mm-hmm. of these things, which is really lacking here. And yeah. that's what, so to me, it doesn't matter. Well, it matters, you know, the credibility, lack of credibility, accuracy, inaccuracy. All right. So he was there. Mm-hmm. So that has smoke. And so now we need to back the smoke up with tangible evidence of fire linking him to the actual deaths of the two girls. Mm-hmm. I still think I, I just still do not. And I I've been trying to follow this as closely as possible, looking for something the prosecution has that they have in the investigation that will, that will physically link him to the actual site where the girls died. Mm-hmm. The lack of DNA evidence that is what's really striking to me here on, on, on two two evidence, and I'm probably jumping ahead on you on this one. No, you're fine. But here, here's why that is bothersome to me. It's it's either indicating it could be indicating multiple things. One, incompetence of the investigators, which we have a lot of data points for potential incompetence of the investigators, yeah. so we can't throw that out. So that's a possibility. The other possibility is he wasn't there and didn't do it, mm-hmm. which is innocence. And another possibility, which I also so, which is also to me extremely remote, and I'll tell you why in a second, is that he was there, he did do it, and he was so good at covering his tracks and his DNA footprint that he's able to wipe it clean. Mm -hmm. But when you look at his courtroom behavior, (laughs) of and and all the reports of extreme mental duress, mental illness, and all his his courtroom behavior of of pacifying behaviors and all these things, and and the trauma, you know. Does that strike you as the type of individual to have the cognizant ability to pull off high crimes and misdemeanors of murder and and have the wherewithal to cover his tracks to get away with it in this way? Yeah. So, so when you look at, you know, again, when, when you're using conjecture, you're always going to miss a, a data point in there. But from the optic I have, the the data points are leaning towards, I just can't still make that connection besides the fact of... They have not demonstrated a, a known link between him and the girls. Mm-hmm. Random killings of two females by one male being ran- totally random. Now, they happen. But again, when you're looking at law percentages, there's very, very, very low. There wasn't a stalking. There wasn't a obs- – I mean, it's not fitting a pattern of what you'd expect to see for this type of murder. Yeah, we are certainly not seeing, uh, like, a, at least as of now, uh, a digital now. footprint or anything, which you think probably would have been introduced by this point uh, of of some sort of evidence of, like, on his phone, he was stalking the girls or whatever, on the, the device. Mm-hmm. Uh, nothing. There's nothing. It's just because it, he seems to be just living his normal life. Um, and then suddenly one day according to the, you know, the prosecution just snaps and decides to kill these two girls. Um, completely and, bizarre. And, 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 and I apologize, Tony, yeah. and no other run-in with the law, None. correct? Yeah, yeah. See, see, it, it's such, yeah. It doesn't make it's any sense. Massive no. spike. Yeah, I mean, it, it is, uh, it's a huge, a huge spike in behavior. I will say this, you know, we're talking about eyewitness testimony, and, and we've heard, um, you know, many people in the courtroom. I know many people who are there. Bob Mata, defense attorney, uh, host of the podcast, Defense Diaries. He's on the ground with us, and he's giving us daily updates. But I'm checking other folks, too, other people that we know, and they're reporting, people I trust, people that have been contributors and other stories here. And it's interesting because the observation on Richard Allen in that courtroom, very different from person to person. Uh, Again, these are people I trust. These are good reporters. 
Um, I talked with Bob Mata last night and I asked him about that because I heard from some others that he's sitting there uh, acting very, uh, I guess, verklempt, like when the uh, the photos were being shown, swaying back and forth, this and that. Mm -hmm. That's what some of the reporting said. We don't have a camera, so we don't really know. And I asked Bob, he's like, I haven't seen any of that. He's like, I don't know what they're talking about. He's like, number one, it's really, it's it's hard to see him face forward the way it's all set up. Um, but number two, he's like, I'm not watching him all the time, but I'm seeing him interact with his attorneys. He's asking questions. He seems to be really with it, according to Bob. He's like, if we didn't know these other things about him, I don't think we'd even be questioning his competency in the courtroom right now. It's just interesting as, as we yeah. view all of it through each of our lenses, um, which it's understandable because we've heard yep. stories of him. We've seen him in court looking pretty like out of it, but apparently this time, not so much, but if you're already expecting that, that's, you know, some confirmation bias right there. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And you, you hit, hit it right there. You know, if you have an optic and lens of something you've heard before, that's 10, it, your brain uh, as a human species, as a human being, we, we love to try to identify patterns. Yeah. And, and so that's why the same thing here with, with eyewitness accounts, they're going to try to identify a pattern that they can do. And also remember, people want to be the 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 person that is the savior, the one that sit, that cracked the the case wide open, the one that you know solved the crime because they want to be their part of doing justice. And so sure. they're, they might try again. This these aren't conscious negative things people are doing. It's just a law of our human nature. Yeah, is that we're going to see things that might not have been there that we want to make that happened that we want to have been part of this that we want to have seen the killer and, and did our part yeah. for uh, due diligence and justice for the families um still not adding up to me on this one though no. no i mean and there's there's two parts i want to talk about here uh the the confession letter which they brought up as being this is a big deal look at this confession letter i mean it looks like something that maybe a kindergartner wrote um big weird letters it's not really consistent it's all over the board on a piece of paper um it, it it was a, so a recreation that a reporter made because we can't see the actual evidence itself, but it, it doesn't look like the work of anyone who's competent. Right? And, and right. like a note, like, I hope I can say sorry to the families. I'm, it's just, it's not the work of someone who's writing a confession letter. I, I in my right. opinion. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I, we've talked about the confessions uh, earlier on as well. The way he was treated in the court system, the way he, his mental health has been, um, uh, talked about so we don't know whether it is or isn't but you know there's issues there and the yeah. issues by the way he's been treated and and the fact that you described what that letter looks like um that's not so shocking or surprising i am not and, and that you know gulls allowing you know the judge is allowing the confessions to stand mm -hmm. because they weren't coerced she said uh, coercion I, yeah. and, and mental anguish you know where's that line drawn um, mental anguish essentially is coercion at a certain and point. It is to me. That's exactly what that is. I mean, you're breaking someone down. and Yeah, and in isolation for how long, yeah. you know, uh, and, in his filth. Yeah. And, and how reliable is that, especially from the, the spy world, Robin, of, you know, you, breaking someone down to get information? How often do you actually get accurate information by doing that? Or do people just eventually crack and say, whatever you they, they think you want to hear to stop you from doing what they're doing to you. It's funny you bring that up. Um, you're so right, though. I never, ever, ever, and, and that's a very definitive line. Mm -hmm. I have never used it, never done it, because it is the most sure way to have someone not tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. Because people will say anything to allow themselves to feel safe again. So when you start, you know, and a great friend of mine, uh, Jack Schaefer, wrote the book, The Light, um, The Truth Detector, as well as The Like Switch, as well as my other friend, Joe Navarro, the um, body language expert. All these people will tell you, even using the word of elicitation, they won't even use the word of elicitation where you're compelling someone to tell you um, the truth and they think it's all manipulation and everything. But we use this uh, – thought process and phraseology differently. We think, how do you inspire someone to share the truth with you before they have an opportunity to lie? Mm -hmm. And the way you do that is you allow them to feel safe that it's okay to tell you the truth. You know, there's, there's lots of interviewing strategies to engage, you know, but you're going to do things like rationalizations, projections, minimizers. You're going to help someone feel safe that it's okay to share information, which might not be in their best interest. And you do that 
by not coercing, by not cajoling, by not definitely not using manipulation or subterfuge, because all those things do not allow the other human being on the other side to feel safe with sharing information with you. The worst thing you can do to inspire confession is to show someone their shame. Another great author I love, uh, Mike Reddington, he's a certified forensic in interviewer. You know, that is the worst thing you can do. And he's gotten people to confess just to minor things, you know, shoplifting, mm -hmm. you know, in stores where they have no video evidence, but he was able to inspire them to share that they, you know, did the shoplifting thing because the last thing he did in the world was he showed them their shame. He used what we call deep, deep empathy, mm -hmm. which is seeing the world through someone else's context and lens. And so... All those things to me were missing when getting these confessions, you know, and, and even I have other friends that worked at Guantanamo Bay, you know, doing interrogations of terrorists. They didn't do that. Yeah. It does not work. You know, I always say, you know, I worked a lot of confidential human sources in my career in the FBI. And I always said this, I said, I'd rather have seven people give me a hundred, 120% of their effort willingly than a hundred people give me 5% of their effort unwillingly because mm -hmm. you can't trust any of the information. So it's always about the behaviors of trust are really simple. Open eyes, communication, transparency, vulnerability. When you display those behaviors, you make the conversation about the other person. You don't show them the shame. You inspire them then to want to share the truth before they have an opportunity to lie. There's so, my long monologue. No, so so you're <laughs> saying locking someone in a solitary room for years on end with no trial and very weak evidence against them, and then to be tormented by judges and or, or by uh, prison guards with Odinist patches on for years, years on end, uh, that may uh, produce uh, unreliable results. <laughs> So as a behaviorist, you, you know, it's really funny. No kidding, Tony. Yeah, I, I, yeah. You're exactly right. So as a behaviorist, when I hear things like that, I no longer am listening. I mean, my mind automatically tunes out to what the individual that's locked up says. Yeah. I'm My mind automatically goes to what inspired them to want to do that to him. Yeah. So my mind shifts not from mm -hmm. him, but to those that inflict that on him, because that says more about them than anything coming out of Alan's mouth yeah. in that situation, because that can't even be counted. You know, it's why, you know, I've known and I've worked with polygraphers my entire career. You know, po polygraphers will tell you the same thing. Mm -hmm. The polygraph machine is a great prop. When used well as a great prop, it inspires people to tell the truth before they have an opportunity to lie. Because all the machine does is measure physiological responses to uh, stresses and thoughts. Mm -hmm. That's why you know when you're working in the spy world and you're working with people that have you know like in intelligence officers on the opposite side, they fall in love with their own their own narrative. They can lie all day long and completely pass a polygraph because they believe it. Yeah, method actors are the same thing in, in the movie industry. Yeah. If you're a method actor, you are living that life of who you are. And I guarantee you, they could probably pass a polygraph when they're in, in method acting role for a role they're doing because mm -hmm. they're so into that character. It's who they are. Yeah. That's why polygraph is not admissible in court because, yeah. again, it just measures physio physiological responses. So any physiological response Alan has to the stressors he was under – what he's saying in those situations, I'm not really paying attention. I'm paying attention to who are the people doing it to him yeah. and what was their purpose for doing that? Yeah. Uh, confirmation bias, I would guess, in a lot of cases. It's like, we got our guy. This is the guy who did that to those kids. And I, if you're not a We're deep gonna thinker, you're going to feel, oh, yeah, he's a horrible human being. You still can't do that to a prisoner. I mean, when you get your wits about you and you're not thinking like a 10-year-old anymore, it's like, yeah, you can't torture the prisoners. Um, they have to go to court. But if you're still thinking like a 10-year-old, you're like, yeah, let's poke him with a stick and nobody's going to stop us because that's the atmosphere, that's the climate of that prison, which it seems like it kind of was, according to many of the reports that we've, we've heard. Let's talk about one other issue here. That's the unspent bullet that they found at the crime scene. Apparently, it was like face down into the mud. Um, this, is, this is literally the only physical thing that the state is saying connects Richard Allen to it. Why? Because he has a weapon that could put this bullet in it technically um so did all the police who <laughs> walked around that scene for hours and days and there was a lot of them uh and they found the bullet by the way after the police were on the scene walking around looking at it um they argue that uh, the the science of this uh of the the bullet itself if you look at it that it it would have been cycled through this gun now that science 
uh, you know, it's not the most reliable, especially for an unspent bullet as well. Um, this thing was not fired through the weapon. It was just allegedly cycled through. How, I mean, this is what they're putting a lot of weight on. How much weight does something like that truly hold when that is the only thing that they say could technically connect him to the scene? A forensic firearms expert is going to have to show how actually an Allen's gun. I ha I have a Sig Sauer. Does that make me a, a suspect in this? Apparently, it is a very according to Delphi, weapon, yes. Very <laughs> so, so here's my other question. So I so here's my advice to defense on this one. So here's a man that seemingly, if it is him, was able to and have the wherewithal to scrub the entire scene of all his DNA, but yeah. he leaves a bullet behind. Yeah. yeah. Spike from the pattern. Yeah. So it's either one or the other. <laughs> He's either really, really good murderer or really really bad murderer and if he's really really bad he would have left the bullet and a lot of dna evidence um if you're <laughs> strangling two children and slitting their throats there's a good likelihood that you're going to have some dna on them you know in, in some way shape or form it, it it's very rare that you would not have anything so either I it's know. a did they not examine the crime scene well enough or they did and they just don't have the pieces that add up to him i mean hell they found hair in one of her in one of the girl's hands it, allegedly it belongs to a family member who's female that doesn't help a whole lot although it does make you question why do you have a handful of your family member's hair uh which i guess mm -hmm. is a pretty valid question at a murder scene but um it, it's there's there's just more that continues to come in here that does not point to richard allen um i'm it just, just i'm waiting I, you know, this is more to me a, a case of, and we're sad because, you know, the families are still looking for justice. Alan's looking for justice, but this seems to be a case of really, really bad police work to me. Yeah, it, 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 it feels like that. And I've said it from the beginning. Is there a conspiracy going on here? I don't know that there is. I, I think I've, I've said it from all along. Like I said, it's simply somebody fucked something up. So we're going to cover that up. Oh, we got to cover up that we covered that up. I'm going to cover up that part too. Oh crap, but I got to cover up that now. And it just layer, 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 layer. And then it starts Wild looking out. really bad. How do I think happened with Karen Reed too? Where it's not necessarily a crime that they're covering up as if they were someone, one of them was involved or something of that nature, meaning the police force, but more so just incompetency or bad work. And, yeah. and then it starts looking really, really bad. And in again, the meantime, it goes to back to the victim's families. They're yeah. the ones still paying the price for it. Exactly. They have to pay the price for it. They have to go down this road with this man who may not very likely be guilty, um, but they want justice. So, you know, they're going to have a, a preconceived a bias there of, well, maybe, you know, he should be. Uh, they, they want somebody to go down. I, I'm not speaking for them, but I, you know, they were testifying and I can tell from what we can see, you know, they're, they're hoping it. they got their guy, but who knows? I, I hope that at the end of this, whatever the verdict is, is that everyone is 100 percent convinced it is what it is, because yeah. because if it's not, if you if someone walks away, especially the victims and say, I hope we were right. Mm -hmm. That means for the rest of your life, there's going to be doubt yeah. and they're not, it's not fair. I agree. It's um, I, I just don't know that we're ever going to get to that in this in this case. Um, not yet. Uh, hopefully we get somewhere close. Welcome to the podcast. If you'd like to listen to an ad-free version of this episode and all of our episodes, then search True Crime Today Premium Plus on Apple Podcasts and press subscribe. That's our premium channel where all of our ad-free and advanced episodes live all in one place. True Crime Today Premium Plus. Search it on Apple Podcasts and press subscribe. Even try it for three days free. You're neck deep in a dark, twisted tale. And just as the tension peaks, bam, a commercial about some miracle diet pill breaks the spell. It's like finding a fly in your soup after the first bite. But here's the fix. True Crime Today Premium Plus on Apple Podcasts. You get to enjoy your crime stories without the junk, ad-free episodes, extended interviews that go beyond the surface, and early access to all the gruesome details. It's like swapping out a can of cheap beer for a glass of fine whiskey. So search for True Crime Today Premium Plus on Apple Podcasts. Subscribe and keep the darkness flowing uninterrupted.